Our next speaker, Major Jonathan Sawtell, is currently a legislative liaison for the U.S. Special Ops Command, where he works directly with the U.S. Congress on budget and policy issues. He was commissioned in 2003 out of the University of North Dakota as an Air Force ROTC, Atmospheric Sciences undergrad. He's actually a trained music composer and an AY-15 graduate of Air Command and Staff College. I do want to add that most of you have read Real, Resilient, Effective, Adaptable Leadership. That's a book, an AU Press book that he actually authored. Um, we're very proud of that as an ACSE grad doing that re very recently in uh, November of, of 2016. And I encourage you while you're here at uh, Air University, you can actually go over to AU Press and get a copy for free. So with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Major Sautel. He's going to talk a little bit about the limits of leadership. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I, I love this phrase. It, it's almost gangster compared to everything we've heard all day and we'll hear tomorrow. Because especially for the optimists in the room, we're going to say, man, like, there's no limits to leadership. And, and in our minds go almost, almost immediately to effectiveness. Man, there is no limits to our leadership effectiveness if we just learn more, study more, try harder. But there's more to leadership than effectiveness. And especially for the majors, as we transition deeper into the field grade officer ranks, we're going to do a lot less doing and more our tasks will be consumed with setting conditions, whether it's policy, resources, morale, Conditions for young folks to innovate or take risk or constrain those, that, that is basically our job as we move on to command and staffs. And for a lot of folks, it's, it's not very rewarding because it's not immediate like the doers, the young folks. It's something that's almost intangible. So when you think about effectiveness, what I want you to think about is how maybe you think, or we think we're specially groomed individuals to become formal leaders and commanders, and we've been handpicked from day one, linchpin, the keystone, to get to where we are now, singularly important in what we do. In, in a flash, when the enemy cuts our comms and hacks our tech, the formal leaders cease, almost cease to become relevant. In fact, in most crisis situations, when things are happening so fast and so chaotic, it's not the formal leaders that actually succeed. There's something else that happens. So while it's all well and good that we focus on being the best leaders we can, and it's all well and good that we've all agreed that we should invest in our people, I'm telling you, it's an operational imperative because the intel points to the fact that future combat will likely be fought with intermittent comms and broken technology. That's my assumption. Communications denied environment, won't be able to chit chat, won't be able to ask for guidance. We're just gonna have to do it. And the enemy knows what's going on. They know that comms is our focal point. And if you can strike down into the heart of that, there's gonna be a pause. There's almost, among some, if we're not prepared, there will be a panic. Or, or a question of what do we do? Or should I go off yesterday's ATO? Or, Am I allowed to take action right now? We have to continue mission. Charlie Mike is what it's called. Continue mission. When the enemy hacks our comms, or a crisis occurs, all these fancy org charts with blocked lines and dashed lines and people important and people not as important and tasks, in some ways that goes out the window. But there is something that survives in the moment of chaos. There is something that, that does survive. It's been cultivated and made before it's all broken apart. And it's these things. Commander's vision is the desired end state. Where we want to go, what we want to accomplish, and in a timeline. And in our values. What do we believe in? How are we going to conduct ourselves as we pursue this vision? And those can be articulated in terms of rules of engagement, laws, laws of armed conflict, chivalry, human rights. So those two together are right now, I believe, called commander's intent. I think we've all heard 
commander's intent. But intentions to me, the word itself is incomplete because I might have intentions, but I am telling you that now that you're cut off element and you're on your own and I am no longer able to contact you, micromanage you, whatever, I want you to carry out the values that have been espoused by our nations, by our agreements, by our leadership, by our integrity. Vision and values, commander's intent. I would rather use vision and values. Our young folks may not understand, I mean, I'm young, young, new, brand new folks may not understand commander's intent, but they will understand vision and they will understand values. So let's talk in that language. Relationships exist when formal org charts are blasted to smithereens. And org charts might be blasted because there's no comms or because, frankly, people are dying and getting killed and things are happening at a disastrous rate. So have we cultivated relationships ahead of time? You've got a great opportunity to meet a lot of people. Really get to know people and cultivate relationships. Colonel Kurt Bowler, group commander of the 720th Special Tactics Group, at one point said, we need to cultivate a professional intimacy with our people. And what a powerful term that is. Not a superficial, every six months, let's chat. Professional intimacy. Imagine our body here, our physical body, as a bureaucracy where the health of the organization is generally taken care of. You might get a scratch or a cut, but eventually it'll heal over months and years. But now imagine that relationships are the nervous system. And in lightning speed, phone calls are made, people reach out, we're talking, we're coordinating, we're pressing on toward a solution and solving problems together. We're solving problems at a rate we trust each other, though. Admiral McRaven, former commander of Special Ops Command, said we move at the speed of trust. So you might trust me because I'm a major. I might trust you because you're an officer or because you wear a flight suit or because you have this badge or you have that experience. But maybe I'm probably going to trust you because I know you. I know the ins and outs of you. You know the ins and outs of me. We're going to trust each other and press on. When the York charts break apart, we just don't know who's going to be able to find each other Who's going to trust each other, and if they're able, going to move out at a speed at which we can still defeat the enemy? We do focus on effectiveness a lot. <clears throat> we spend the, almost our entirety of our sessions time focusing on, focusing on effectiveness, and a lot of our PME growing up thinking about effectiveness, but it's, it's, not, it's not complete. It's not complete anymore. We must bring up resilience and adaptability alongside effectiveness is we're going to fight in this chaotic environment. So I'm going to lay out some definitions for you, uh, just to spell it out nice and clear and some clever illustrations. So this is a fishing bobber. We are like bobbers, and our troops are like bobbers. We hang out generally where we're cast. You generally give an idea of what's going on under the surface. But unfortunately, when bobbers are cut off, man, they are absolutely worthless to the boss, and the boss, the fisher, is, has no bearing on the bobber. It's not effective. I would like to redefine effectiveness singularly today in a measured term, which is to say, we will only define effectiveness as the ability of your subordinates to replace you at a moment's notice. That's it. If they can't, we're not effective as leaders under my assumptions of this future fighting environment. So effectiveness is good. They're going to replace you because formal leaders aren't as important when chaos actually happens, especially if comms are cut. But there's another aspect of what we need, and it's bouncing back. We call that resilience. Resilience is bouncing back and oftentimes bouncing back stronger than we were before. It's something that we talk a lot about, but we don't fully understand yet how to actually get there. But to illustrate resilience, I will use two, oh no, two bull moose. Hey, can you bring up the slide after this with the two moose, please? Anyway, these giant moose are about to go to war. Their haunches represent, back one, I know it's hidden. Their haunches represent industrial might. Their able body, their strength is their population they can pull their troops from. And their antlers represent their arms, their, their, their war fighting capability and in their heads are their resolve. Those are all the things that able-bodied armies need. And moose will fight to the death or until one becomes less resilient than the other. They keep lunging at each other and fighting and scratching and pawing until there's a delay in the one that can bounce back. And the other one seizes that opportunity. When moose fight, 
It is strictly resilience only. Which one can stay the most resilient the longest? Is it the industry? Is it the body? Is it the weapons? Is it the people? And moose are great. They are meeting their design of their capabilities-based requirement that we've worked so hard in the Pentagon to fulfill. But when their conditions change, they are unable to adapt. These two bull moose found themselves in a river with rising water around them that froze and they both succumbed to their own death. <clears throat> they were effective. They were resilient, but they could not adapt to their new surroundings. But there is a creature that is adaptable. It's actually a subterranean creature. It's not very resilient to being stepped on because fire ants don't like being stepped on. They can't really survive. But when Hurricane Harvey hit South Texas, and literally feet of rain fell, fire ants did something. They adapted to their new surroundings. These fire ants leveraged their relationships and formed floats. They create an acid, they bond tight, they create a cabin on top that hides the queen, and then they just float wherever the water takes them until the waters recede and they start the new colony in the vicinity where I've been letting down. They are willing to change their entire lifestyle to preserve their survivability. And I think Secretary of Defense Mattis would like the fact that ants are ready to go from living underground to living on the water for a while. Why? Because he said something very interesting at a council, on a Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing the other day. He said that the United States especially is an impermanent experiment. So are institutions, organizations, teams, perspectives, relationships. Even our own ideas are just kind of hypotheses. They're our best guess at what we think is happening in this universe, and our decisions we make as leaders are our best guess at what we think we should do to get the response we want out of it. Allow me to illustrate the impermanence of our United States or any other organization or institution for that matter by taking a look at a poem, specifically the first stanza of a poem written by attorney Francis Scott Key around 1814. Francis Scott Key was on a British troop ship eight miles from Fort McHenry off the port of Baltimore. The Brits had already burned the United States Capitol and if they could just take the port, it'd be the end. When you hear or when you sing the national anthem of the United States, it is the first stanza only. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that that first stanza ends in a question mark. It doesn't end in a period or an exclamation point. Does the banner yet wave over the land of the free? He hadn't seen it yet. He went to sleep over the monstrous bombardment and the hate and the violence that the Brits were raining down on him, and he hadn't he was just waking up and had not seen it yet. We ought to go to sleep at night knowing we did our best as warriors and leaders that day to keep our flags flying. But we ought to wake up in the morning like Mr. Key <coughs> and ask ourselves if the flag is still flying. When you sing it or when you hear it, don't get complacent. It ends in a question mark because we haven't seen our flag yet. Now, it's easy to say, hey, Jonathan, like, Sky's falling, man. I see what you're saying. Sky's falling. That's right. Well, the sky might not be falling. But we need to look at something. We need to look at the risk involved. So leaders must manage both risk and opportunity in the short and long term. This is the foundational principle for strategic thought. And if I have young people under my command or under my leadership who are going to be cut off from me in fighting, I want them to start thinking this way right now. And it can start in a fun way. I have an opportunity to jump off this stage right now. What's the risk? I'll get hurt. But I have an opportunity to be remembered for a long time if I do it. The risk is that you'll be remembered for the wrong thing. But I have an opportunity to make a difference. No, man. Just, I have an opportunity to drive this truck under the C-17 wing right now because my, my sergeant wants me to go right over there. But I have a risk of running into that multi-million dollar engine. This is simple stuff. But it's the foundation for strategic thought. Like, we can get there. These are drills. These are, these are ways that we can start thinking now 
that will change things. We can act like the flag isn't going to be there in the morning, but in the back of my mind, we also need to think, hey, it might not be, short and long term. Risk is a big issue because, as you all know, we're confronted with uncertainty all the time. We really don't know when we make a decision or we talk to somebody or we say something or make a proposition or whatever what the outcome is going to be. So we're constantly living in a state of uncertainty. But leaders are the best for thriving in uncertainty, but leaders are also most uncomfortable with it. I think history books are written about leaders who confronted and tackled ambiguity and uncertainty, but there's also plenty of books of paperwork of leaders who've been fired when they didn't address uncertainty properly. But we have been chosen. We volunteered and we have been chosen to face uncertainty. It's our job to do it. So how do we make sense of an uncertain future? Well, there's three ways we set conditions as leaders, particularly in the field grade ranks, to allow us all to address uncertainty. We create processes, leverage automation, centralize just about anything. Because we all know that everybody else under subordinate to us is addressing uncertainty as well, and we want to we want to eliminate human error the best we can. So let me talk about these three things for a minute. The positives and the negatives of creating processes, leveraging automation, and centralizing anything. So imagine you're driving a car. You're speeding into a turn, and poof, you're done, and your subordinate takes over the drive. It doesn't matter how effective a driver you've taught them to become. There's only so much they can do. So as we create these conditions for them, and then come back a generation later and ask them to do something different, we have to think about whether or not these three things were the best idea after all. Processes are great. You don't have to know anything about baseball. All I'm going to tell you is that the, the top baseball match in the United States is the World Series, and the World Series champions were the Houston Astros, and that this was the MVP player, George Springer, on the cover. No big deal, right? If it was right after the World Series that this was published, you'd just think it was an informational magazine. Oh, cool, man, yeah, nice review. But it wasn't. It was published three years and three months before the World Series 2017 even happened. And Sports Illustrated writer got the team and the MVP player right. What? Processes, baby. In a stable environment where the business rules of baseball or national security or acquisitions regulation or enemies that just aren't innovating and evolving in a stable environment, you can produce F-22s and B-21s and magazine covers three and a half years ahead of, of when they're due because the, the world ain't changing. Baseball didn't change that much. They took some risk in the short term of business and one in the long term and they're going to stick around for a while and being a winning team. I believe this is like the environment that we in the Air Force and the military have set over the last several decades as the global leader in defense. We set the rules, we create processes, because by the way, we're the ones out front. <sighs> That's not the whole story. And on a predictable future, processes work great. But when the changing norms and fat tails and black swans and all these other things that we're talking about in uncertainty, cyber, there's other things that happen. But inside the institution, Processes are fun because you can mitigate human error. You can go exactly where. And then we have performance reports bullets that are always saying save time and save money because you somehow streamlined a process. They can quantify success. Processes are awesome like that. But they limit tinkering. And they usually set conditions for us to smash failure, as been mentioned 400 times today, because that's what you do in a process. If you're the weak link, you get it. But if tinkering and failure has been engineered specifically out of the process so that people don't fail, those are the necessary character traits it takes to develop resilient, tinkering innovators. And I think that's where we're at in the Air Force right now. Our senior leaders are asking us to innovate. And we're like, is there an innovation checklist? Like, how do I know when I'm supposed to innovate? Like, are you going to validate my innovation to make sure that I'm innovating in the way that I ought to innovate? And by the way, if I don't, it doesn't work out, am I, I going to get fired or a bad performance report because I didn't innovate the right way? Man, that's, I hate to say it, man, that's kind of where we're at. I think a lot of folks where we're at. 
processes are rarely adaptable. This is Amazon. That's a process. It's an amazing process. I got to go see the Amazon Fulfillment Facility, ninth generation plant in, near Seattle. And uh, it, it looks a lot more cleaner than this now. This is an older one in England, actually. But I had two nerd questions to ask Amazon. Like, how and what or when do you decide to automate? So if you look here, all these people, robots could do that. But they're not. And robots aren't doing that because robots are expensive. And Amazon is here to make a profit, not defend the nation. So what they do is they have temp jobs here that they can expand and contract their workforce based on when the hiring seasons are. So they automate a lot up to the point where it's too expensive to have robots that depreciate in the non-buying seasons. The second part of their automation is this. In order to train them as fast as they can, which is basically a six-hour course plus three hours of safety and human, or, uh, human resources, they automate out all analytical effort from their people. You are told what your job is, and you are shown the correct anatomical movements to do your repetitive motion a thousand times a day, 11-hour shifts, every day. You have no idea what the big picture is except for delivering stuff. You can't think because there's no thought. It's been engineered all the way out. Now imagine walking into that culture of, of workforce and asking them to innovate the processes. By definition, you have engineered out their ability to think so that you could have a flexible and highly skilled workforce that's trained quickly, and then you can, you can fire the temp jobs in the afternoon. You got to admit that when you get to a command position or leadership position, so much of our time is spent on human factors, poor choices, misbehavior. And I think it would be really easy to get to air staff or your command staff and just kind of like engineer out, engineer out the error. But the secondary effect is that is it, you're losing a lot of ability to think, you're losing about a lot of ability to tinker and fail and innovate. The last thing that we can do a lot is automate, just like Amazon does. And I think a lot of people are scared. There's a lot in the news right now about how automation will replace most of the United States workforce. Up to 80% of jobs could be automated. And I think we should be uncomfortable with that because companies are automating out the human because the human is, is the weakest link in the whole process. They're slow. They've got needs. They get sick days. And just robots and computers don't do that. But in the national security environment, we want people making life or death choices, not, not robots, at least not yet. We want somebody, a human in the loop, somewhere near the data mountain making the strategic choices that have life or death consequences, political consequences. We should not follow industry standard when it comes to automating, because industry standard is to make a profit and make things as efficient and effective as possible. We are trying to create a war machine that will apply violence as necessary, that's survivable, that's effective, resilient, and adaptable. We cannot follow industry. We have to set our own rules when it comes to automation and where the human is. And the only way we're going to do that is if we have critical thinkers in the right spots that aren't constantly creating policy and procedure that eliminates the need to think in the first place. The last thing we do in the face of uncertainty is centralize. We bring it in. I'm in charge. Take the hill, like General Quas said. It feels good, right? It's good to be in charge. But centralization has always been a luxury of the ability to communicate. If you go back to Sun Tzu and read, and read The Art of War, and they're talking about the drummers. I think it would have been cool to be one of Sun Tzu's drummers. Man, you start banging one arm, and then it means maneuver left, and banging the other drum means maneuver right. But that's because they had the ability to communicate. Desert Storm was defined by the ability of the joint force to communicate. It scared so many of our adversaries around the world. But we put all our money into communicating. 
Anybody read Starfish and the Spider? You know, it's a great book about centralization versus rapid adaptation. If you step on the spider's body, all the legs die. It's done. But a starfish, you can chop up all kinds of different pieces, chuck it back out of the water, and they all regenerate and grow. That's the kind of force that we ought to fight with. The kind of force that's thinking about risk and opportunity since enlisting early. The kind of force that's thinking about uncertainty, what they would do if they had to do it. The kind of force that's been trusted and had a chance to practice living in that moment. And failing a little bit, you know, not too much, but just getting a taste of it or whatever, because all of a sudden, boom, they're in charge now, and we aren't. Those are the kind of people that I think we should cultivate to have out there so that there's no moment, there's no hesitation, we just keep fighting. So this is where the practical, this is really, really it gets practical for most of us. Like, what can we do about this problem? What can we do about the looming problem that the future of combat means we're not, we can't communicate? Well, let's acknowledge that two things. People and technology are our DNA. The DNA of what, though? Of what molecules, of what, of what part of the body? Well, the TTPs. And what are tactics, techniques, and procedures? That's just what we do. It's how we fly, fight, and win. But what are TTPs? TP, TTP, TTPs are the molecules of the organs of operations. And when you link all the operations and organs together, you have the body of a strategy. So when the enemy's sword dives into the body and cuts right through all the ops, right into our DNA, you got two things left. You got whatever people you have left, and you have whatever technology you have left. So therefore, we need to do two things. Cultivate relationships is the first one. We're going to lose people. We're going to lose connectivity. <clears throat> But if we all have a genuine shared purpose and understanding of vision and values, we can reach out. We're going to form back up in small groups, small teams. Could be anybody. Could be State Department workers with fighter pilots. Could be maintenance officers in, in non-governmental charity organizations downrange. Just, just coming together, trying to just solve a problem, press forward to the objective. But you have to cultivate now. You can't cultivate it after the crisis has occurred. So we need to make time to allow for ourselves and for our people to meet as many people and cultivate relationships the best we can. And even in a more practical note, guys, like if you cultivate professional intimacy in your unit, if somebody were to die, or there was an assault, or a suicide, or something happened to a family member, that self-healing network is already in place. And it's activated, and it's fast, and it's caring, and it's genuine, and it's love back in where the darkness has entered the unit. But if you don't have that professional intimacy, it's just not there. If you're trying to piece together stuff, it's not going to happen. It's ten times worse in a combat setting. We've cultivated relationships. And lastly, we're going to cultivate options. Whether you're a force support officer or maintenance officer, ops research, meteorologist, intel, pilot, C2, whatever, everything we do is dependent on some sort of technology. It's worthy to think about how we would get our jobs done when our primary means have been taken away. And the primary gripe with that is that it doubles or triples our training workload. Okay. It's risk and opportunity. <clears throat> Either we're going to keep pencil whipping the fact that we're training in a calm out environment and acting like we really are, but actually not really switch into the right radio because the other one was too hard, or call and knock it off because it was too uncomfortable, or exercise commanders just simply saying, hey, this is not what we're here to do right now, folks. We're weighing risk and opportunity, I'm telling you. I, the intel is mounting that this is the future of combat, so let's find the opportunities associated with fighting in the black, fighting in the dark, fighting without comms, and all the incredible leadership opportunities that are associated with investing in your people and the way we've defined effectiveness, which is their ability to replace you at a moment's notice. Cultivate relationships, cultivate options. So in summary, when everything you know and everything comfortable about our military lifestyle 
has gone away. This is what's left. And we either have the authorities and the confidence and the, and the capability to press on and keep trying to win, or we're going to stand around and question what the heck we're supposed to be doing and waiting for guidance. We're asking somebody if they know what to do right now. Let's, I don't want to be there. We need to win. If our freedoms and our way of life is an impermanent experiment, my hypothesis is that we cultivate this now. That's all I got, guys. Thank you very much.